to Katrina's Creations. This is a special Monday edition, and yes, I am wearing the same clothes that you saw me in on Saturday because I actually filmed these videos on the same day. So I gave you a little teaser about this video when we did the video on Saturday, and I talked about my grandmother's flapper dress and some other antique linens and things that were given to me by my mother over the past week. Now this is the second time I've gotten some things from my mom recently because they are downsizing. If you missed the first video where I talked about some antique quilts and things, you can click the link right over here and that will take you to it. Um, and I will put it in the end screens as well. If you want to watch this video and then click the end screen, it will take you over to it. You can see it then as well. So let's get started with what came out of my mother's cedar chest this week. So the first thing, we are not sure how old these are, whether these were baby blankets of mine. They don't look ancient by any stretch of the imagination because this lace on it is done with machine. Um, you know, it's, it's bought or it's done on machine. So I am thinking it's, it's not something that's homemade, just looking at it. But there are two baby blankets. Here's the first one. It almost reminds me of a crocheted puff stitch. But like I said, this is all done by machine, but it's really pretty. So we have one of those. And I'm just going over those briefly because they're not as old. And again, this is also made on machine. And the center almost reminds me of a linen tablecloth. You can see it. Yeah, there you can see it's almost like an embossed knitted fabric. So those are the two new items. Like I said, I'm not gonna spend too much time on them because they're not that old. Um, then we have a little baby, it looks almost like a top, it's too short to be a dress, like a little jacket of some kind. My mother thinks it might have been hers. It does look like it's yellowed over the years. There's no tag in it. So I think this was hand stitched because if you look on the back, or this actually, this might be the front. It has hand smocking on it. You can see across here. And then it has these tiny little buttons right here. This was definitely for a newborn, just looking at the neck and just the general size of it. So I'm not sure if it was worn with the front open or if that was the back and this was the front. I tend to think this is the front because that's where the collar is split and the way the collar is finished off. But there is hand smocking on the front on both sides as well as on the back. There's some discoloration right here. This would also lead me to believe this is a newborn because this would fall right about where the belly button is. And I wonder if that is like from a newborn from the belly button. It just, it's right about the right spot. Just some guesswork there. Now the next item is a granny square blanket. Now my mother says she does not remember making this, although she did have an orange sofa at one time. So it makes me wonder if my, my grandma on my mother's side I think did crochet, but she because she gave me something years ago when my daughter was little that she had crocheted. So it just makes me wonder if maybe she did. I never saw her crochet. Um, so I'm not sure. My mom said it might have been it might have been my mother's grandmother made this. So we're not sure. I'm guessing from the colors because it's orange. I'm thinking it might have been from the late 60s, somewhere in the 60s or 70s. Um, I don't know if it's acrylic or if it's wool. It smells more like wool. It has a different odor. You know, wool always kind of has that, has that animal sheepy smell. 
but I can't tell. It's been in a cedar closet for years, but when I look at it, I cannot tell if it's wool or acrylic. I did try to do a little test, what they call the spit test, where you try to join two ends. I tried to take some of this uh, fringe that's on it, and you know, you get it slightly wet, and you rub it together to see if it kind of pills and felts together. It did not do that, although some of it is sticking to itself. So some of it feels like it might have wool in it, but I just, I have no way of knowing. If it, if it is acrylic, it's kind of scratchy acrylic, which would also make sense too, because acrylics at that time period were not actually soft. Now they can do things to make them soft. But this is a pretty good sized, Afghan. I'm only holding up half of it, but here you can see it. It's got fringe on all four sides, and this is about three feet wide, and it's probably about six feet long because I'm holding it up, and it's just in half, and here's the other half of it. So I'm holding it, it's almost square. So this almost would have fit a twin size bed. So it's about three by six feet. So it is very large. And at some point she must have run out of the orange itself because there are some spots, if you look closely, this orange, I don't know how well it's gonna show up. This orange is a slightly different color than this one. This is slightly more lighter than this one. So I'll hold it up in the light. You can see a little bit. You can see that this is slightly lighter than this. So at some point, you know, I see some of the squares are just, they're very, very close, but you can tell there is a different difference, a definite difference in the color. So um, yeah, either the color, the dye lot changed or she had to buy a different yarn. Um, but it's huge. It is a granny square and each square is composed of four different colors. Well, no, some of them are only three colors. Some are four color differences. Some are three. There you can see some of the four color differences. They all have a white center. And then they had, she probably just used up scrap yarns to do the rest. Here's one that's only three colors. So it's, but it's huge. So, like I said, it's, it is scratchy, like a rough wool. It feels to me sort of like wool, just by the edges of it here. But um, I really don't know. And it's not, they don't look like worsted weight. This is more like a fingering weight. Let's see if I can pull up a strand here so you can see it. Just the strand of it. This is not worsted. That's fingering weight. I didn't know they even had like acrylic fingering weight back then. So who knows? I have no way of knowing how old this is, but I believe to the best of my knowledge, this was made by either my mother, either my, my mother's grandmother on her father's side or her mother's side. We're not sure which one, but yes, that is that is a huge, huge afghan. Now we get into one that has an interesting story. I will hold this up. This I remember seeing this when I was a kid. We don't know if my grandmother made it. We tend to think, just based on what I found, which I will show you in a minute that's on the back, that this was made by my mother's grandmother on her mother's side. Uh, so this would be my grandma Marsh is who we think made this. And I'll tell you why. Let me hold it up first. These are satin. The, the, all of the squares, there are two shades of a peach and then there is a cream and they are all satin. Now this is not finished on the back. It's only finished on, this is just the quilt top basically. And just looking at this, they didn't match edges up very well. As you can see, some of the points 
do not match whatsoever. And I'm not sure if she bought, I keep thinking that this was made from some of the, my grandmother's sister's dresses, but these match so well, you know, they go together and they're both peach, but they, they coordinate together. Um, they look a little orange in the lighting, but they actually, this is a dark peach. This is a light peach. I just can't imagine all of, all four of the girls in my grandmother's family wearing peach color dresses, unless it was for a wedding. And there is coloring in here, like something that would be on a wedding dress, because there's a satin there, but the, the whites are not all the same. Some of the white or cream is plain. Some of it has like a tan draw, uh, like a design on it. And then some of it is a different pattern altogether. So I have absolutely no idea. Again, we do know, like I said, that it was made more than likely by my mother's grandmother. And I will show you why. On the back of the quilt, because satin is so unstable as far as for a quilt, she lined the back of it, each individual square. So apparently this is not like a solid piece that she sewed them to. She actually cut out a square and cut out the lining and cut out and stitched them together, bias stitched, or just loosely stitched them together um, in a basting stitch. And then she sewed it together. And the reason I can tell that, I'm going to flip the camera around so you can see this a little bit better. All right, right here, you can see basting stitches. Um, most of it's done in white, and you can see she stitched right over top of where she sewed them together. But this one, apparently she went back with a different colored thread. So you can see where she basted each of these individual squares together before she sewed them together. But the interesting thing my daughter and I discovered when we were looking at this is what this backing was made out of. There is one square in particular, this one right here. I'm gonna turn it so you can see it well. It's a little more yellow than the others. And I'm gonna kick this light up some and see if you can see what we saw. You see some writing there? This was, let me see if I can open this so you can see it a little bit more. It says 25 pounds GW and then it says NE, can't tell what the rest of it was, sugar. It says sugar here and when you move it up here you can see in big writing, you can see sugar going across here, but in smaller writing right along here, it says granulated sugar. Let's see if I can lift it down and show you. You can just faintly see granulated sugar right here. And then if you look closer, Right here, you can see some writing. It says, Great Western Sugar Company, Denver, Colorado. You can faintly see it, but with a bright light, we can see it fairly well. Now, the, my daughter and I looked this up. When we saw there was writing, we looked it up and Googled it right away. And Great Western Sugar Company was a sugar company in Colorado. They had um, they had refineries in Denver, in Longmont, and in Loveland. And my family lived just outside Loveland. So we tend to think that this was on my mother's side of the or um, the grandmother on my mother's side of the family uh, because that's where she lived. So the backing to this, or at least some of the backing to this was made out of old sugar bags. And this was an old 25 pound sugar bag that she apparently bleached and most of it came out, but you can still see the writing on it. 
And this sugar company was went into business in 1901 and was in business before they, they still technically are in business, but they merged with another company in 1967. So that would place this more than likely. I mean, my, my grandmother was born in 1909, and we're thinking that this is somewhere in the early 1900s that this was made. Just because how long ago were they putting sugar into flour or into uh, fabric sacks? I think they stopped doing that by maybe World War II or just after World War II. So it dates it somewhere in that time period. So that was the fascinating story with this. Will I ever finish the back of it? No, I'm just going to leave it the way it is. I think it has more meaning. And I, I don't really want to cover this part up. I think this is interesting. So I will be putting this away the way it is at this point. Now we get to the flapper dress. Now I never thought this dress was overly pretty until I saw my granddaughter put it on. I wore it one time when I was a teenager, but that was a very long time ago, so I don't remember what it looked like. Now I'm going to insert pictures of my granddaughter modeling it. I'm not showing her face uh, just for safety issues. She is under the age of 18, so I'm not going to show that. Uh, but you will be able to see her wearing it, and you can see this, the beads, and then I'm going to show you some close-ups of it. Here is the close-up of the flapper dress. Now, we believe, just from what we can see, that every one of these sequins was put on by hand. There's bugle beads here, and then these are sequins. Now, my daughter and I did look up sequins, whether they had, we know plastic was not around at that time. So we wondered what the, the sequins were made of, and they made them out of a cellulose from gelatin, and they also made them out of metal at that time. These are not metal. You can actually see through them. They are, they are a teal color, but they have a um, iridescence to them. And if you hold them up to the light, you can see through them. So they're not metal. We believe they might be the gelatin substance. Um, the only way I can test it is to put one in hot water and see if it dissolves. Um, I do have a couple that have fallen off. There are some areas where they're missing um, from over the years. The netting itself, the whole dress, the inside is done. And this was actually hand sewed by my grandmother. It was sewn on a machine, but this was sewn at home. And you can still see all of the actual stitching in here. There's no labels. It has a V-neck in the front and the back. And so there's this teal color material on the inside, and it's actually like a slip that you can see through. And then there's this overlay of netting that the sequins are actually sewn to and the bugle beads are sewn to. Now, the flapper period ran from 1920 until 1929. Now, this is not a little girl's dress. Our conclusion that we've come to is that um, this was made somewhere in the mid-1920s. My grandmother was born, like I said, in 1909. So the beginning of the flapper period, she would have only been, in 1920, she only would have been 11. An 11-year-old is not going to be wearing this dress. By the end of the flapper period in 1929, she would have been 20 years old. That time period fits a little bit better. We're thinking she was in her late teens 
to early 20s. So my granddaughter um, is actually probably close to the age my grandmother was when this was made for her. Now, if you noticed in the picture, the dress came down for a flapper dress. It was very modest. Um, I often wondered why my great grandmother, what would have possessed her to make a flapper dress for my granddaughter to begin with, or for her grand for her daughter to begin with, because I never would have let my daughter out of the house wearing a flapper dress back then, if it was the true flapper dresses, which were actually very, very short. They were at the knee or above at that time. And just just them being sleeveless, which this is sleeveless, and having a V-neck was a little bit on the scandalous side for the 1920s, but that's what flappers were known for. Now, my grandmother was not a wild person by any by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm thinking that my grandmother made this for her, but made a, a more discreet version of a flapper dress because on my granddaughter, she's 5'2", this came down mid-calf. My grandmother was only five feet, so the dropped waist would have been a little bit more dropped and the length of the skirt would have even been a little bit longer. It still, like I said, would have been a little bit scandalous because there was the um, the short sleeves. I'm sitting, I paused for a minute because I just happened to notice something. If you notice on the shoulder here, and yes, these are sweat stained. You can see it. These are sweat stained, so this was used. Um, you can see that this has a little curly cue here. When you look on the other side, apparently the curly cue has completely come out, but you can see really faintly where it was drawn before she put it together. There is a, I don't know if it'll show up or not. You can see it just faintly. There's a little teeny marks that go around here, which also leads me to believe this was done by hand because you can still see the marking that she either used some kind of an ink marker or something to mark where she was going with this. So, yes, it is a very, very detailed dress. And flapper dresses, actually, I was very surprised. Vintage flapper dresses sell in the hundreds, the more beading they have on them, the more expensive they are. Some of them, the most expensive one I saw was $7,000. So I have no idea what this is worth. It's not going anywhere. We're going to keep it in the family. But it's just a neat thing to have because it's a piece of history. And our other thought, too, my daughter happened to mention, and actually my mother, I think, mentioned it, is we don't know for certain this was made for my grandmother. We're just kind of assuming Um my grandmother had three older sisters. This might have actually been theirs and gotten passed down to her. But we have always called it Grandma's Flapper Dress, even when she was still living, and she never corrected us on that. Um, the funny thing is, my mother said when she was a child, she used to put this on for dress up. Um, now you look at this and, and think it, it is 100 or it's close to 100 years old. It's, it's averaging somewhere between 90 and 95 years old. Um, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Then we have this little blob here that we've been looking at. It matches the lining. And in the pictures, you saw my granddaughter holding it up to the waist because looking at it, we believe this was some kind. It's, it's definitely a type of a bow. We think there might have been a rosette. Let's see if I can hold this out for you. The ends are all finished and the ends all are at an angled point. So we know it wasn't some type of, there's, it's not long enough to have been a tie. And we think that maybe it sat like this and there was some type of a rosette or something here in the center. And there is a small waistband on the dropped waistline. And we think this maybe sat off to the side, like where she was holding it in place. Um, this would probably look a lot better if I ironed it, but to be honest, I'm afraid to touch it with an iron. I don't want to do anything to damage it. Maybe if I had a steamer, I might try it, but um, I'll show you where the waistband is. This is actually the back that I'm looking at. So the, the waistband is only on the front. And this is where it kind of hangs over it had kind of a droopy front but when you lift up the droopy section of the sequence you can see 
this belt right here. It only runs on the front. It does not run around the back. And this part that kind of hangs down over the waistband because they did have like dropped waists and they were kind of, they were, just, they were very blousey where they hung in the front. In the back, the way it blouses, um, it doesn't gather at the waistband. It kind of blouses underneath the hips. So um, that's how we kind of term, determined that this was the front as opposed to the other side. And on the sides, because it would have been a little tight to walk with the, um, the, with the netting, if it was sewn together on the sides, the sides are left open so that you just see the satin in it. So this is the side of the dress and these are the front and the back. So it's split open in the, in, in the, on the sides. Now we can look at the inner seams. Like I said, it is hand sewn. I'm going to flip this upside down so you can see it. It was sewn on a machine. So you can see machine stitching on it here. And it has had some repairs to it. I can see the hemline was repaired at one point. It looks like it was hand stitched at one point and then they put and machine stitched it on top of that. Now, they machine stitched the edge to keep it from unraveling and then they folded it over and then they put the, the um, hemline in to do this because the machine stitching is not on this side. You only see the hand stitching. So I think it is a treasure to have. And like I said, I never thought the dress was all that pretty until I saw it on someone, on my granddaughter. And I think it was pretty because it was my granddaughter, but I also think it was, it just, it, seeing it laying out flat never did it justice compared to what it looks like when it's being worn. And that's probably one of the last times it'll probably be worn um, because it's so fragile at this point. Um, the netting has deteriorated in, in several places. There's actually, it's, it's worn through. But I think overall it's a, it's hold up, held up pretty well. And I think it's a really pretty dress now that I see it in its full glory. Now the last thing that was in the bag, well, the last two things that were in the bag that my mother gave me was this blue dress, dinner, dinner coat. Uh, it's not very heavy. It is lined with, you know, like your regular lining like what you would put in the back of like a vest or something. Um, it has regular lining, but it's velvet. And then it has, I'm just going to show part of it here. It is as long as the flapper dress is. I don't know that they would have been worn together. They kind of would have clashed. But this is like a deep royal blue. And this is a also a lining material, but it was meant to be seen because you can see it extends over here, but you can see where it changes color along here so that this is the inside but this is meant to be seen uh, you can see a little bit of wear here where the velvet is actually wearing off and they stitched along the velvet to give it this kind of ribbed look but just on the collar and this fits my granddaughter as well it's about the same size as the flapper dress and the very bottom of it, I mean, there's no buttons on it or anything like that. The very bottom of it has this really cute little ruffle to it. You can see it right here. That's just a real light little ruffle that runs along the outside. So I'm not quite sure what it was used for. I mean, it definitely was not used for warmth because it's not thick at all. It was more for looks. And... Yeah, so I'm not sure if it was just pinned shut or what they did with it, but here's what the collar would have looked like open. Well, if you were wearing it around your neck, that's what the collar would have looked like. And it's kind of a princess cut as far as the front of it goes. And the last item, I only have one of, 
My mother said she does have the other one. It just apparently fell out at home. These are kid leather gloves. I'm going to put these on the back of this blue so you can see them. My grandmother was a very small person. She said she was only about five feet. My mother can actually still put her hands in this because my mom is also very petite. I did not get the petite part. But these are kid leather. They are so, so soft. So if I can turn this light down a little bit. It's still going to blow it out a little bit. But look how narrow these gloves are. I'm going to try to open up the thumb all the way. That is the width of the hand. It literally is about three inches across. It is so tiny. And here's the fingers. It looks like a child could have worn these. But like I said, my mother can still put these on. And you can see the wrist is extremely narrow. These are so, so very soft. Um, they are real leather. They're kid leather. And they have these little sweet... And they have these sweet little snaps on this side. So you would put them on once they were on you would snap them into place to hold them. And they do go all the way up the arm. And my grandmother actually had several different colors of these. So I've seen them at my mother's house in blue, and I think she had a burgundy pair and maybe gray. So I don't know if these were worn with the flapper dress or if these were just separate. I have no idea. But yeah, they're just so tiny and so petite. I mean, my grandmother only wore a size four or five shoe and so does my mom. Um, so yeah, they, these were very, very tiny. I wish I could wear these because they are, like I said, extremely soft inside and even on the outside. So um, that's the last object that was in there. So I hope you've enjoyed this little trip into history and looking at some vintage fabric and vintage clothing and vintage blankets and afghans and if you have enjoyed this please give me a thumbs up and don't forget on wednesday to stop by and watch the progress of entries on the holiday along thanks again for watching everybody bye, -bye.